Welcome to Seeking Alpha CEO Interviews. Quality of leadership is a decisive factor in stock performance, so we provide in-depth interviews with the best and brightest CEOs in the public markets. We publish limited excerpts from our interviews on social media platforms and the full interviews at SeekingAlpha.com and in the highly rated Seeking Alpha mobile app. To find the full interviews, open SeekingAlpha.com or the Seeking Alpha mobile app and search for the phrase CEO interviews or simply type a stock ticker into the search box. Welcome to CEO Interviews. I'm your host, Jesse Redmond. And today I'm joined by David Steinberg, CEO of the newly public Zeta Global. David, thank you for joining us. Jesse, so nice to be here today. As a lifelong entre entrepreneur myself, I understand how hard it is to get one concept right and then go out there and execute on that concept. You've managed to do this multiple times now, not just get the concept right, but also do the execution. To what do you attribute your success? Well, you know, a fear of failure and a lot of really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, as, as you know, as an entrepreneur, <clears throat> it, is, it is something that is more difficult to come up with the strategy, come up with the idea, and then execute on it. And then it gets even more difficult to execute on it as it gets bigger. And what I've learned over the you know five companies that I founded and, and now sold three and taken two public, uh, couldn't couldn't say that yesterday, but uh, you know the uh, the truth of the matter is the key to doing that right is first and foremost understanding what you don't do well personally, and hiring people who can be your foils who are exceptional at what you don't do well. And as an entrepreneur, it's hard to think we don't do anything right really well, right? We all think we do everything well, Jesse. But it's knowing what you don't do well, taking ownership of it, understanding it, and then putting the right people in their jobs and letting them do them. Sounds like that takes a level of humility as well. Well, listen, you know, you're an entrepreneur. Like we've all been humbled at some <laughs> point, right? I mean, it, uh, I, I've, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, there's no linear move to the top from what I've seen. Most of my friends who are entrepreneurs and most of the entrepreneurs I've looked at and studied, everybody's had ups and downs. And, and you know, listen, I, I joke when I first started, I was a young CEO. Now I'm an old CEO, right? So as an old CEO, you really, you're, you, you take things more in stride. You know, you're, you're able to really let people do their jobs, which I would tell you 31 years ago when I founded my first company, I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't good at that. Yes, I can say that I've been, been in that same situation. You're working with John Scully again on this project. And for those not familiar with John, John was the CEO of Pepsi. And John, I think, was responsible for that Pepsi challenge era. Kids, yep. ask your parents about the, about the Pepsi challenge. Yep. And then, it, then John went on to have a real uh, profound imp impact on Apple and some of the early back ad advertising. What has it been like working with John on this project? And what does he bring to the table? Well, if you truly want to disrupt an industry, you have to understand it. And to have a partner who didn't just do and create the Pepsi Challenge, he also created the 1984 Apple ad. He was the CEO of Apple for many years. Uh, just to have him as a partner and his understanding of not just where marketing was, but truly where it's going. And you know, it also doesn't hurt that he's one of my best friends. So we've been, this is our third company together. Uh, we worked together for 21 plus years and been really good friends. We vacation his wife, Diane, and my wife, Kristen, are, are very close. And, uh, you know, he's just, he's just a, an amazing human. Uh, and it's great to have him as my partner. And it's great to be able to bounce ideas off him and, and learn from him and go back and forth. And every day when I'm using my computer, something pops up asking me about cookies. And do you want to opt in? Do you want to accept? And quite frankly, I don't often know. And I subjectively will say, well, I kind of trust these guys. I kind of don't. And I don't think that's even the right way to handle it. But cookies are something that's in front of us every day now. Can you talk a little bit about what a cookie-less world might mean to a lot of advertisers and how that impacts your business? So let me start by saying we don't use third party cookies to identify people over the Internet, which I think has created some confusion uh, in our in our issuance. But the reality is that as we move to a post third party cookie world, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of uh, marketing companies to adapt. We are a marketing technology company. Over 90 percent of our revenue is software based. But 
we are competing for marketing dollars, right? So, you know, it sort of all comes out of the same pot. Companies that are heavily reliant on a third party cookie, I think they might be challenged in the short run. I, I want to be clear though, I think that just like there's always been changes in the marketing ecosystem, I think, it, it, you know, companies adapt. And I think the vast majority of companies are going to adapt. And I think, you know, what, what people don't often understand is the ability to serve better ads to people that they care about is actually in their best interest, as long as you're not doing it in a way that's intrusive. If all advertising went away, all publishing would effectively go away. I mean, I, I think there are five companies I can count that have made a subscription model really work on the internet, right? Pretty much everybody else is, you know, marketing driven or advertising driven. So if you're gonna see marketing, you might as well see marketing that's relevant to you. Uh, and you might as well, you know, have it work for you instead of seeing stuff that's stuff you're totally not interested in. And in doing my research, I came across some what I found to be kind of startling metrics in terms of the number of consumers you, you have data on, how many data points you have, and how you're using these data points. Can you talk a little bit about those metrics in terms of the number of consumers you have information on and the total number of data points and what crunching those numbers looks like? Well, it's a lot of numbers to crunch to answer your question. So we, we are, uh, you know, I sort of joke, we're the third largest data graph in the United States. And the joke is when, when you think of Google and Facebook as one and two, Zeta is not probably the name that normally jumps out as number three. <laughs> but the reality is in the U.S. alone, we have 220 million opted in people in our data cloud. Uh, you know, people opt in to be in our data cloud. We believe that permissioning is the future of data. And, you know, we're very on top of it. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're looking at, you know, quite frankly, trillions of touch points against people. So demographic, psychographic, transactional, behavioral, all of that is fed into our artificial intelligence. But what we do is a little differentiated, Jess. What we do is we only use that data plus our artificial intelligence to build intent-based scores. So we never share the underlying personally identifiable information with anybody. We don't license it to anybody at any price. Even our 1,000 global enterprise clients don't get to see it. They're seeing intent-based scores, which protects them, protects us, and protects the consumer. But by using our data and our artificial intelligence, we're able to help large enterprises to create, maintain, and monetize customers at a substantially lower cost than they can without using our software. And I think one of the examples I was reading about, let's say to to Toyota, just to pick a name, is interested in advertising. You, they can put forth a campaign or perhaps a product or a truck, and you can give them, give them you can crunch some numbers and give them the, the probabilities or chances somebody might be interested in the advertising or their product. It's, it's even more complex than that. I mean, what we're really doing is taking our clients CRM data, we're ingesting it into a consumer data, data platform called a CDP. We then merge that with the Zeta data cloud data. We resolve everything to a Zeta ID in the CDP. So we effectively take out the person's name, social security number, date of birth. We make sure there's nothing that's personally identifiable in there. And then we're mapping it to all of the attributes in our data cloud. And our artificial intelligence is looking at the exact journey that a consumer took to buy that car in the 30 or 60 days prior to buying that car. We're then able to look at the other 220 million people in the data cloud and say, these people are doing this exact same thing right now, meaning they're highly probable to want to buy a red make of car in this geography in the next 30 to 60 days. So we then use our software stack to market to that person. So everything sits inside of the Zeta Marketing Cloud and it puts us in a position where we're really able to help our clients cut their effective costs to create customers. But because half of our revenue is software generated subscription fees and half our revenue is software generated utilization fees, much like Snowflake, right? Or much like live person where mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're paying as they use more, it allows our software to automatically bill more 
as our customers ramp up on it. So we have a number of customers that start at a $50,000 pilot or a $100,000 proof of concept that can scale to what we call our scaled clients, which are north of $100,000 a year. And, and then you know, I think our average scale client is, is well over a million a year on average in revenue. We're able to scale pretty quickly because of the way the software and the AI work with the client's platform. And finally, congratulations on the IPO today. I believe the reference price was $10 a share and the company sold 14.8 million shares roughly, which according to my math, raises about $150 million. With the cash in the bank, wind at your sales, what can investors expect for the balance of 20, 2021? And do you have any particular plans with the cash that you raised? Well, let me start by saying that, you know, people keep asking me, why are you going public now? It's a choppy market, so on and so forth. The truth of the matter is first and foremost, We've been doing this for 13 years and, you know, from a RFP perspective, getting invited to engagements, we miss out on stuff because we're private. You know, it's just harder to get large enterprises to trust a, you know, private company. So by being public, we felt like we'd be able to accelerate our sales growth. And that was really important to us. Second, we feel incredibly confident about where we are from a business projection perspective for this year. So feeling really, really confident. And, and as you know, so because of that, we're, you know, we felt it was a good time for us. As it relates to having cash, you know, I think you'll see us look to continue to do uh, tuck in M&A. We are, you know, lever uh, free cash flow positive, uh, which is not a bad place to be as a business. Uh, so it's nice to have the extra cash, but in reality, the main purpose of the cash is for you know, future M&A as we do tuck-ins. We're not looking to do anything transformational anytime soon, but you know, the ability to add great technology and great people to our platform is very, very exciting to us, Justin. And for investors that are excited about the story and looking to learn more, can you share the symbol with them? And you can, can you share where the stock's trading and your website or where they should look for further information? I don't know where the stock's trading because we've been on the phone for a few minutes. It's been <laughs> moving around a bit, but uh, the reality is that it trades under uh, a, you know, the, the, the ticker is very complex. It's Z-E-T-A. <laughs> You're, John is a branding expert. <laughs> you know, when, when, you know, John said, keep it simple. We, we went with that, but no, it's, it's uh, Z-E-T-A. We're really excited. We opened on the New York Stock Exchange today. And, you know, quite frankly, we feel that investors who join us on this journey are going to be heavily rewarded.